What if we had a second referendum? Um, can I turn to the, the question of a second referendum? I mean, even uh, Nigel Farage has said that might be an appropriate thing. Uh, David Davis has said, if you can't change your mind, then what's a democracy for? Um, why is the Labour Party not in favour of a second referendum? What we've asked for and demanded in Parliament has been a um, meaningful vote in Parliament at the end of it. So MPs I'm talking about the people deciding, not Parliament. Said. And what happened with this bill was it was an undemocratic power grab by the government. We're not asking for a second referendum. And you're not going to? That, that's, that's out. OK. Labour will support or put forward an amendment in favour of a public vote. That public vote would include an incredible leave option and remain. You can see Jeremy Corbyn's right behind him, but not necessarily in agreement. In a statement tonight, the Labour leader said the party will back a public vote, but also continue to push for other available options that he's not ready to give up. Well, today I'm going to talk about how it could work. And a second referendum is actually more likely now, thanks to Labour. Even if you disagree with me, consider subscribing by the end of the video. The recent resignations of eight MPs from the Labour Party to support the independent group forced its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, to distract the media and more MPs from the ongoing anti-Semitism scandal by calling for a second referendum. Now, a second referendum has always been Labour Party policy since it was voted on by Labour Party members before the 2017 election. However, it has become more likely recently Labour had a three-point plan for Brexit. The first option was to call for a general election. This was going to be done after the withdrawal agreement was rejected and the vote of no confidence held. If Labour would have won that vote of no confidence in Theresa May, then the general election would have occurred. They would have then gone on to try and negotiate their plans for Brexit, which I'll come on to in a minute. But they lost that vote of no confidence and Theresa May remains Prime Minister. So the second option was to try and use the government's approach in reaching out to the parties as a way of getting their version of Brexit. Now they didn't meet with Theresa May until after the Commons had voted against a no deal because ultimately they can't be seen to be supporting a right wing no deal Brexit because it would split the party. Labour's Brexit proposal was to remain in a customs union along with four of the key points. It was the five point plan, remember? So last week, that proposal was put to the House of Commons and it was defeated. So now, Labour want a second referendum. A rewritten amendment means it could see Labour abstaining from the vote on Theresa May's withdrawal agreement. So not voting on the deal at all, which could give Theresa May her needed majority and ensure that the deal gets passed through Parliament. However, they would only be abstaining from voting on this deal if a second referendum was promised. It's conditional on the amendment. This amendment will be expected to be put to the House on the same day as the withdrawal agreement and it will be voted on, which will put pressure on MPs who object to no deal and object to May's deal because they're secretly Remainers to vote for an amendment that would put the deal to the people. Therefore, it would give the option to remain under Labour's plans. But if it passed, it also puts pressure on hardline Brexiteers to vote against May's deal because it would be the only way that those hardline Brexiteers could potentially ensure leaving the EU gets enacted without a second referendum. A second referendum, of course, could have the option to remain and, of course, hardline Brexiteers do not want to remain. Now, there's not really enough hardline Brexiteers in Parliament to have a majority to be able to create no deal, which is why many of them, such as Jacob Rees-Mogg, have slowly come behind May's deal on the condition that the backstop changes. We won't, I wouldn't have thought, support the deal as it stands. I think the real problem is the backstop because it doesn't have an end date, it's permanent and it would leave us bound into EU rules in Northern Ireland, to a customs union, and to barriers between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And that doesn't work, it won't work. 
So as long as that is there, this deal will not get the support of the bulk of Eurosceptics. But if there were to be moves uh, on the backstop, you might change your position. I mean, and that doesn't necessarily have to be in the withdrawal agreement itself, as I understand it. It has to have equal weight to the withdrawal agreement. So if it were to be an appendix, that would be satisfactory. But then the backstop is itself an appendix. So you can add to the withdrawal agreement without reopening it, it seems to me. So that would work, but it must be of equal legal standing. Now, there's every chance that this amendment would get voted down, so that means the government plans goes ahead. The government's plan was to have the vote on the deal, and if that fails, there would be a vote on no deal, and if they vote against that, then there would be a vote on Article 50. And if they vote against that, there would be no deal. If they vote on Article 50, we would extend Article 50. So during the Article 50 extension, might form a piece of secondary legislation for a second referendum if and only if there becomes a larger parliamentary majority for it. For a second referendum to work, it has to be a piece of primary legislation. That's an act that the government puts forward to parliament. So even if an amendment to the withdrawal agreement requiring a second referendum to be held after May's deal is passed, the government would still have to put forward a motion to enable that second referendum process to begin. For that to happen would take a majority of her own MPs to put pressure on her and threaten resignations, essentially forcing the government to either put forward a second referendum or potentially face a parliamentary vote of no confidence. Now, if there was a parliamentary vote of no confidence and she lost, it could either force her to change policy or it could go as far as forcing a general election. It would all depend if Jeremy Corbyn held that vote of no confidence on the government or the individual policy. But let's imagine that there was a majority for a second referendum and the piece of primary legislation was put forward to the House by the government. So now it would be Parliament's turn to come up with a date and the details of that referendum. This could take a minimum of 22 weeks. The legislation could take 11 weeks, then 8 weeks of questioning taking place, then a week for transitioning between the referendum legislation coming into force and the campaign itself, and then of course a 10 week referendum campaign. Now there's been talk of two options for a second referendum for quite a while now, either a three way vote or a two way vote. Labour want the vote to be between Theresa May's deal and Remain while hardline Brexiteers would prefer it if a hard Brexit option was on the ballot paper, such as no deal. Although, I have to say, it probably wouldn't be a no deal if Parliament were voting for this. There was no majority for a no deal last time Parliament voted on it. The majority of Parliament are against a no deal, and that was actually what persuaded Jeremy Corbyn into actually going into talks with May once Parliament voted against no deal. But Parliament's opinion could change if May's deal is rejected by the 13th of March. Because no deal would be the quickest way to leave the EU, but it certainly wouldn't be the easiest way of leaving the EU because, of course, overnight would be a huge pile of administration work that would have to be undertaken. And the cost of that is what many, many people fear because of all the time it would take. And there's no assurances over how or if the EU would accommodate us for that time that needs to be to be able to put in border checks and know what to do particularly with the Northern Irish border. So having a no deal option without either an agreed transition period and a possible Irish backstop with it looks very unlikely in a second referendum scenario. It's unlikely that a parliament would vote for a complete crash out scenario. If anything, Parliament would have already tried to avoid crashing out by extending Article 50. So what about May's deal? Well, if a second referendum was announced under Labour's plans amendment, then it would only be offered on the condition that May's deal got accepted. So if May's deal gets rejected by Parliament, again, it seems unfair and pointless to put a rejected deal on the ballot paper. Even if it did get accepted, it would only be because Labour abstained from the vote if and only if this entire plan goes ahead. Either way, amongst both Leave voters and Remainers, this is the least popular option. Leavers hate it because of the £39 billion that were paying to the EU and the Common Rulebook, 
which means being overseen by the European Court of Justice. Remainers hate it because the withdrawal agreement without the backstop means that the UK will be leaving the customs union and single market, which means that it could risk the economy and an immigration assurance policy to supply the labour market. So I think it's more likely that rather than having an unfair three-way vote between No Deal, May's Deal and Remain, because the three-way vote splits the Leave vote, it's more likely to be a two-way vote. But then it's just as unlikely that Labour, the SNP, the Lib Dems, Greens and Plaid would agree with a No Deal option being on the ballot paper. Unless it was the No Deal amended option which assured Northern Ireland, for example, and made visible plans that were agreed with the EU. But most supporters of a second referendum want an option to remain on there, which of course most Brexiteers or anyone against a second referendum uses the argument for not having a second referendum because of the referendum we had in 2016 that already answered that question, do you want to remain in the EU or leave the EU? Now the Remainers argue that leaving in 2019 is not the same as it was presented in 2060. Therefore, we deserve a second vote. The Leavers' argument is that we haven't actually fully enacted and delivered on the 2016 referendum yet. Therefore, asking again only divides opinion and it doesn't unify trust behind the government. Let's face it, 80% of people voted in the 2017 election for parties that were campaigning to leave the European Union. Now the EU obviously want us to remain. President Macron said there is a chance to reopen the door. But it's hard imagining the UK once again sitting in an EU parliament voting for an EU budget that pleases other EU member states. Secondly, since the UK has decided to leave the EU, the EU has made it clear that it wants to improve its own defence spending for closer cooperation which the UK could and probably would veto should it remain. Then the Conservatives and Labour who were campaigning to leave this whole time could disappear from the UK political mainstream, making way for other parties, the far right, the far left, the centre ground of politics, completely new parties you've never heard before. And all those parties could turn into MEPs in the European Parliament and they could cause EU problems in the EU. If we got problems over here, it could translate into the EU Parliament and create problems over there. And it could be that UKIP or the Brexit Party become popular enough again to get another referendum on leaving again, making way for a third referendum. However, remaining in the EU could be a solution to Brexit in the same way that extending Article 50 is. The EU would unlikely agree to us extending Article 50 beyond July as the European elections are in June and it would be difficult because there are currently no plans to have UK sitting MEPs in the European Parliament. There are options available to the UK about dealing with those MEPs such as only having MEPs to the end of the Article 50 process but it's unlikely to be on the timescale of years which negotiating an entirely new deal would take, which is where remaining might come in. But we would need to have a clear negotiating strategy before triggering Article 50 again, because Article 50 is gonna be just as chaotic, just as time-driven if we did it again. But that's if and only if we wanted to trigger Article 50 when it comes to that time. We might even have to have another referendum to decide at that point. Either way, Brexit is going to go on and on and on for a while, but a second referendum, due to the parliamentary arithmetics of it, still seems unlikely. But do you agree with me? Join in the debate below and subscribe.